different uh, countries represented there. There's a whole section on Egypt, which is very interesting. Um, lots of mummies that they have there. This was at the end of 2002 when we had the privilege of going there. Christmas sing so long. Okay. I'll tell you the, the biggest challenge for me is to show you a few slides and I have to pick them out of thousands. Thousands and thousands. The last trip I took 6,000 pictures. So you can imagine, you know, like I sit there and I'm like, and it's folders and folders and folders and discs. And so when you see a slide like that, you know, I've like prayed about it and hunted for it. No, this is the one I'm showing you tonight. Okay. Thank you. Well, let's thank the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for answering our prayer, and I pray that we will be able to see these slides. In Jesus' name, amen. Can I use a clicker now? This one. Okay. Okay, last night we saw um, a picture of this. What is it? The Cyrus cylinder. Guess how big it is or how small it is? It's this big. It's only 22 and a half centimeters long was discovered in 1879, about 80 years after the Rosetta Stone, and this contains the history of Cyrus and how he also sent the Jews back to Israel. Okay, let's just see if I can go this way. There we go. This is Titus's arch. This is in Rome, and it was built after his death. His brother did it for him. Um, to honor his conquests. And what's so remarkable about, remarkable about this arch, okay, it was built in, in the year 82 AD, so it has been restored. It's nearly a th um, 2,000 years old. And what's inside there? Can you see the menorah? The candlestick, the golden candlestick? This was carried off in the year 70 AD when Rome conquered Jerusalem. And where is that menorah? It's a mystery. Some people believe it's in one of the storehouses uh, secretly being kept in the Vatican. But um, nobody's for certain what, uh, what's happened to it. Okay, now let's go to Ephesus. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered, and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. 
That's the first letter from the Bible. An amazing place. I think you can spend many weeks exploring Ephesus. You can see they had a very, very elaborate um, plumbing system. You can see all those pipes. There's a fig tree. Lovely figs. I brought back a little piece of fig tree, and I'm trying to grow it. I hope I'm going to succeed. <laughs> There's a cat on the pillar. Amazing architecture. And there is the goddess Artemis. Uh, that's how the Greeks refer to her. You can see there it's being um, excavated, that image. And the Romans know her as Diana. Now, where do we read about Ephesus? Not only in Revelation, we in the book of Acts, in 1 Corinthians, in Ephesians, and 1 and 2 Timothy. So go check in your Bibles all about Ephesus. And this was the big um, battle when Paul came there. They were worshipping this idol. This multi-breasted image. Who can guess what that is? Toilets. You are correct. They had an amazing system going there. You can see, um, I'll put my cap there that you can see the size. And if you look down, you'll see there they go on, on the other side, but it's very deep. It's a few meters deep. That's where the, the sewage was running. Very, very jacked up city. Another kitty. And uh, just look at this, eh? Um, they've been doing a lot of excavating, making lots of discoveries. That's a sarcophagus. That's where they put dead people in. There's our guide, Umar. And he's um, telling us that's the library in the background. You can see it's an amazing structure. I'm standing there in the middle. And who can see that over there? Can you see the golden candlestick? Very interesting. Uh, chiseled out there in the marble. This is the menorah, seven branch candlestick, Judaic symbol, incised on the steps of the Celsus, Library Roman Imperial Period. And uh, I'm just going to go through. You'll see this amazing architecture. This is the Agora, the marketplace. And um, it's square. And in, in this corner over here, they believe this is where Paul addressed the Ephesians. Incredible. You'll see many, many pillars. And this is a theater. We sang a special item there. We just felt, let's sing. And people gathered around and it was really special, you know, singing to the glory of God in this um, ancient theater. You can see these huge walkways. There were many people, tourists coming there. We had a, a nice little worship service under this tree. Uh, I think it's a pear tree. And um, we read at each of the seven churches, we read the letter in the book of Revelation, which was really special. You can see the fruits on the tree there. And there's a, a whole bunch of sarcophagi, many of them. And um, you can see toward the left and the right, there's pillars and bases everywhere. I, I wish I could show you all those pictures. They're just incredible to see the artifacts that they've discovered in the excavations. And there's our very punctual uh, Turkish bus driver ready to take us to the next site. So I look forward to meeting with you again. God bless. So who can guess what the next city is? What comes next? Come on. Come on. We're studying the book of Revelation. What city comes next? There we go. Which is the next church? Which is the next church? Who's going to go? Oh, I see one hand waving from the back. <laughs> All right. So in two nights time, <laughs> actually on Friday evening, will be taking us to the city of Smyrna, which was, which is the next letter. So thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, 
We have uh, prayer request uh, cards which we've been handing out each evening. So if there's anybody you would like at this time to hand back those cards filled in, now's the opportunity. You could just raise your hands and the ushers will come around and collect it from you. Also, if you would like a pray prayer request, you can collect one right now. Or if you'd like, uh, on your way out, uh, the ushers will hand them out to you. We have a dedicated group of prayer warriors that pray over each and every request. So I appeal to you, if there's something that's burdening you, or a loved one, or whoever you would like prayer for, it's completely confidential, and it would be wonderful. There's great power in prayer, so we really uh, encourage you to fill in those prayer cards. And we invite you to share as your prayers are answered. Please do let us know. It's lovely to celebrate the Lord at work in our lives. And um, it's a wonderful joy to share with others that even without the detail, the Lord has answered my prayers. Can you celebrate with him? It's such a joyful feeling. So now we did say to you that there were a whole range of opportunities to participate. So we're going to test your memory from last night. So, how many of you took your little leaflets home? You had two flyers that you took home last night. There was a, a little black and white handout, one like Nolan has there. And then there was a, a printed color one that was a summary of the prophecies in Daniel chapter 2. So now, it's test the team time. Okay, so Nolan has the first question. Let's go. Okay, a lot of the uh, answers to these questions came from Daniel 2. The first one was, Daniel took... No credit or glory in himself when he told the king. But as for me, the secret is not revealed to, and what is the, uh, what is the, the word missing there? Anyone? But as for me, the secret is not revealed to me. That's the word. For any wisdom that I have more than any living. He was a very, very humble man. Okay, so here's the question. Okay. Daniel acknowledged that he did not have the answers. Who had them instead? Okay, and he said that to the king very clearly, that the answers are not with him, but rather there is a God where? Which God? The God where? In heaven. That reveals secrets. So right up front, and you might remember some of the, the images that were up on the screen last night as Daniel stood, an artist's impression of Daniel standing before the king. And the king saying, so can you tell me? And he said, no, I can't. But the God in heaven who reveals secrets, he can tell. Okay, Nolan. There's a song that we often sing, a chorus actually. He's got the whole world in his hands. So that is the clue for this next question. And it says, Scripture asserts the supreme rulership of God by saying, can anyone finish that sentence? It says, he removeth kings and he setteth up kings. So God has always been in control. The Most High ruleth in the king of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. So the prophecies that Daniel interpreted for um, Nebuchadnezzar applied to which time? What was the relevant time period in the prophecies that we looked at last night? Yes. 695, that side. Okay. So right from the time of Babylon until when? Until when? What was the last time period that was in the study last night? So it started before Christ through up until? Right up until now. All right, and what was the last part of that prophecy? The stone, and which time period is the stone? Is that now? Still to come. So the prophecies went all the way from the time of Christ through to today and actually into the future. Okay, well done. So there were a few listening. 
And there's a few who came, even if they, who came knowing. So, well done. Okay, last one, Nolan. Okay, the last one. The blueprint of history delivered by God in a dream seems dependable, for it has already been fulfilled in all particulars for 2,500 years. But can we trust it for the remainder of Earth's history? God says, and this is taken from Daniel 2.45. The dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof, sure. Daryl. Okay, so tomorrow evening, we're going to, we've been rather easy on you tonight. You, your handout that you will get as you leave this evening, okay, has a summary of the things that Brian is going to cover with us. And right at the back are a couple of questions. So we're giving you, we were easy on you tonight. Tomorrow night, we're going to ask you what these questions are. Okay. Thursday night. Thurs next night. <laughs> we're going to ask have, and have a run through. So if you have a few moments between now, you've got a day's grace. So tomorrow evening, you have plenty of time. Um, let's see. The more we go back to it, the easier it is to remember. One of the things that received resounding applause last night. Do you remember those three ladies who lifted the name of Jesus on high? So this evening we have the privilege of welcoming Chris to share another of his talents and to praise the Lord in music. Chris, thank you. Well, far more comfortable with a guitar in my hands than a, than a clipboard. strength and my refuge whom shall I fear I know you are near all of my days I live for you Lord establish my path there's one thing I ask that I may dwell in your house forever lifting up your name that I may dwell in your house forever, lifting up your name. Dwell in your house forevermore. Holy Spirit, Sweet anointing, teach our hearts, our lives we pray, that I may dwell in your house forever, lifting up your name, dwell in your house forever.
Good evening, friends. Thank you, Chris, for that beautiful item of music. Um, we're going to try and get you out on time. We're running a little bit behind, but I'll ask you to bow your heads with me as uh, we begin with prayer. Our Father, our God, we thank you this evening that we can be gathered here again to hear thy word. And this is all because of your grace. We ask that now, with your presence, touch each heart, speak to each mind, give us understanding and clarity of thought to listen to you as you speak to us tonight. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, if I can just come out of this here. Okay, we ready to go? Got a lot of material to cover tonight. So I need you to be a little bit faster tonight. I'm going to pick up the pace. I see the clock is against me here. Our message is Revelation's greatest end time signs. Today, in this postmodern world, people are really anxious about getting on with life. But at the same time, they're wondering what is going to happen in this life. People are looking to the horizon. They're looking at what's happening in the world today. They're looking at what's happening in the, in the countries. They're concerned about the future. And, and this is not just for South Africa only. It's a global problem all over the world. People are anxious about what is taking place. They look at the events in the political arena. They look at what's happening in the show, social world. They look what's happening in the economical world. They're looking at what's taking place in the nations around the world, and they wonder what is coming next. Well, the book of Revelation, friends, is God's plan for the future. And so we're going to look at what God has to say to you and us, to you and I today. Many people think it's a closed book. Many people think it's a book of unexplainable images, of cryptic writings. And people think it's about beasts and symbols, and they tend to avoid... This book, in fact, this book, friends, is all about Jesus Christ. Notice in Revelation 1 verse 1, the revelation of whom? Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And so this book was given to John through the angel who got it from Jesus, who got it from his father. And this angel, friends, sent and signified, that means announced. This is an announcement to the world because this was given as a revelation from God to John for you and I are living in the last days. And so, friends, it's not a book about somebody who has written some human writings. It's not about a someone who's seeking to push their own agenda. It's not about a psychic or a seer. It's not about anybody else. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so John, when he received it from the angel, he wrote it down. And the book of Revelation is God's last message. And so it's the last book in the Bible. Friends, it's an open book by definition. The name is... The revelation, which means to reveal, to unveil. And the theme of the book, friends, is about Jesus. In fact, the first chapter in verse 7 says this here, Behold, He is coming with clouds, and every eye shall see Him, even those that pierced Him. And all the tribes, it's a message for the entire world. All the tribes of the earth will mourn because of Him. Friends, it's a message that takes our eyes of earth to heaven. It's a message, friends, of hope. It's a message of a better day and a better place that God has gone to prepare for us. And so if you're going through problems tonight, 
if you're experiencing difficulties in a relationship, if you have health challenges, if you have financial challenges, it's a book of hope. And friends, we're going to look at some of this. In fact, it says, behold, he's coming with clouds and how many? Every eye will see him. And so it's about the glorious return of Jesus Christ. The last chapter of the book talks about the second coming of Christ. And guess what? The last chapter of the book speaks again as it closes about the coming of Christ. Behold, Jesus says, I'm what? I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Notice, friends, he says, and behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according as his work. And so, friends, this is what it says here in the closing verses. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The Father says, I'm coming quickly. The Son says, I'm coming quickly. The Holy Spirit says, I'm coming quickly. And so John's response is, Even so, come Lord Jesus. Friends, but you might be saying, wait a minute, Brian. Haven't we heard this before, that the Lord is coming soon? We've heard it from our parents, and our parents heard it from our grandparents. In fact, that has been around for a while. And so, friends, I want you to know that though you and I don't understand how quickly the Lord is coming, He is coming sooner than you and I can think. You know, there was... Uh, a famous preacher by the name of HMS Richards, who was the speaker for Voice of Prophecy in America. And he was conducting a meeting like this with a large audience one night. And he was speaking on the soon return of the Lord. And someone in the audience got up and said, wait a minute, Jesus may not come now. He may come in a hundred years. He may come in 200 years. Well, Pastor Richards Richard looked at this man. He was about 70 to 75 years old. And he said to him, Sir, by your looks, it looks like you won't be here for another 100 years. Friends, Jesus comes when you and I die. The next minute, the very second, we come up in one of two resurrections. We're going to look at it another night. The Bible says... When Jesus comes, there will be a resurrection of the righteous. That's the first resurrection. Then you have the millennial judgment that takes a thousand years. And then after that, you have a second resurrection. And so depending on how you and I die, whether we are in Christ, we come up in the first resurrection. If we are not in Christ, then we come up in the second resurrection and that's the resurrection of damnation. The resurrection of eternal death. And so if you and I die, we're going to look at another study later on. The next minute we get up, the next second, between the time you die and one of the two resurrections, it is a period of inactivity. And then it's either you see Jesus if you come up in the first resurrection, come in the clouds of glory, or you come up in the second resurrection and you face the judgment of eternal death. So friends, we want to know from this book here, is there anything that we can hear and understand from God in terms of His soon coming? Well, you see, Jesus was on the Mount of Olives, and He was talking to His disciples. And as He spoke to His disciples, they had a burning question. You see, in chapter 24, most Theologians, most Bible scholars call this chapter the little apocalypse because it was Jesus' discourse on end time events. You see, Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives and he's looking down on the city of Jerusalem and you can compare Matthew 24 with the book of Revelation that we're going to go through and you'll find the signs in Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation are very, very similar. And so, the burning question the disciples had, which you and I am sure may have tonight, was, what will be the sign of your coming? And what, everyone? 
the end of the age. They want to know, how is this world going to come to an end? Lord, is there any evidence that we can know how soon you're coming? How can we tell? And so, friends, Jesus gives us prophecy so we can know where we are in the scope of earth's history and know how near he is. Not the day he's coming. Nobody knows that. But, friends, we need to know how near he is to come. And so, are you interested in that same question this evening? You see, in Matthew 24, Jesus gave 20 signs that outline what will take place from the time he left soon after his resurrection when he ascended into heaven and what would take place when he comes back the second time. And so he told his disciples as he was looking down on the city of Jerusalem, the, the, the very people who he had come to had rejected him and he knew he was facing the cross a few days down the line. And so he said to the disciples as he looked from Mount Olives, he looked on the Temple Mount with its gleaming, huge marble stones. It was a magnificent building. It was something the Jews took pride in. Even the Romans had spent lots of money to rebuild it after it had been destroyed. And so one day, friends, Jesus said to the disciples, you see these stones? The time is coming when there will not be one stone left upon another, and that was to take place soon. Jesus was about to ascend to heaven in AD 31, and Jesus knew some 40 years later that the city was going to be sieged by the Romans, and it was going to be destroyed, and many people would lose their lives. He gave them signs so that they would know how to escape from the destruction that was coming. You see, the prophecies in Matthew 24 have a dual application. They had specific application to the people living during the time of Christ, but they also had a dual application for the people living just before Jesus returns. And so Christ saw that soon the Romans would surround that city. And when Titus came, first Cestius came, and then Titus came, and the siege was awful. A million Jews perished in that city. And so, friends, Jesus gives a masterful, a masterful presentation, and he blends in both events things that will take place shortly during the time of the disciples and things that will take place later on shortly before he would come. And so he spoke of signs in the world of religion. So Jesus said that things would not be right in the political world. He said things in the world of nature would be in an upheaval. He said things in society would break down. The family unit would break down. People would be so cold and callous in their relationships. He read all this year, and so he was telling the disciples, listen, although this destruction is coming, if you take heed of my prophecies, you will be saved. Do you know something? All those disciples that took heed of what Jesus had to say, the signs that referred to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, they left the city and escaped the destruction. We have no time to go into that tonight. But friends, those who ignored Bible prophecy were deceived, they were lost, and they were destroyed. And those who survived were taken captive by the Romans. Many of them lost their lives. Many of them lost their lives. And so it's important for you and I today in these last days to understand and to know Bible prophecy so that we may not be deceived and taken in with the lies that are going around. And so let's look at the signs in the religious world. You see, the disciples asked the question, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? And so Jesus points the first signs as religious signs. And you know what? As I looked in Matthew 24, there are three times that Jesus says, take heed. His first answer was, beware lest any man deceive you. Three times. That's important, that number. Three times God says, beware of deception. Beware of deception. Beware of deception. And so he said false Christs and false prophets would arise. Notice what he says here in Matthew 24, 24. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders. And so a time will come when these men and women too would lead people astray. In fact, the Apostle Paul says, he, he, he recognized when he was about to die, he says, the time of my departure is at hand, and he says, I know many of you 
will be taken in with deception. And so, friends, I want you to look at this here. Some of these statistics are from the United States, but it's, it's all over the world. Notice what it says here. In the United States, during the last decade, the number of people who identify themselves as belonging to the New Age movement, you've heard about that, has increased by 247%. That is a whole lot more now. The modern occult, Wiccan, pagan, and Druid religion is now listed among the 10 largest organized religions in the country. Teens especially are attracted to these occult movements and outnumber older converts by, converts by three to one. In fact, I saw a sign in Berea just the other day. I got a picture of it. I didn't bring it to show you today. But it, it was actually saying that those who are interested in the New Age movement dial this number right here in South Africa. And so, friends, this is on the rise. This is on the rise. And so, I want you to listen to this little video clip here. It's only two minutes, so just listen. Don't worry about so much about the beginning, but closely about the end, because all these false Christs and false prophets have one thing in common. They lead men and women away from the Word of God, and they play down sin. And so, this is happening all over. And, and, and if you and I don't spend time in God's Word, we could land up being deceived by some charlatan claiming to be Jesus Christ. So just listen. He enters this hotel conference room in Hartford, Connecticut with a security team that rivals a head of state. An adoring audience greets him with calls of daddy and sings his praises. He is 60-year-old Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda from Puerto Rico, a preacher, an evangelist to be sure, but to his followers and in his own eyes, he's more than a man of God. Just ask him. I'm Jesus Christ, man, in front of you. That's right. He says he is the second coming. He claims in 1973 he had an epiphany. When Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, came to me. He integrated himself within me. So why you? I don't know. In the mid-80s, Miranda started his own ministry called Creciendo en Gracia, or Growing in Grace. It's a religious movement that claims a presence in more than 20 countries, mostly in Central and South America, but also in the United States. From Hartford to his headquarters in Miami, he says there are more than 30 teaching centers nationwide. We don't give membership cards, so I don't know how many I have, but certainly are millions. Every week we, we grow. And with a 24-hour cable channel, netcasts of his sermons and radio programs, Miranda is out to spread the word. Those who believe him, like these followers in Miami, the son of man is back. also embrace his unique interpretation of the Bible. For example, sin no longer exists. God doesn't see you as a sinner. For me, you are a, a perfect spirit. There's also no such thing as the devil. Satan is a, a Hollywood uh, character. As for prayer, he says it's a waste of time, and he calls all other religious leaders liars. The lies began in Rome. I'm against all those teachings. This man is popular. He's got hundreds and thousands of followers in 20 different countries. And so if you just go and type in the internet, false Christ, you, you'll come up with well over 5 million, not 5 million, 500,000 hits. And so the thread through all these false Christs and false prophets is that they lead men and women away from the word of God and direct men and women to themselves. And of course, they have private jets and helicopters and mansions. Uh, I don't want to bore you with that. But uh, this is what's taking place. Friends, Jesus said these things would take place. And it's happening in your generation, in my generation. We've had a few right here in South Africa. And so counterfeits are not always easy to recognize. And friends, when we don't take time to spend personal time with the Lord in His Word and through prayer, then you and I will certainly be deceived. And so notice what Revelation has to say here in Revelation 16 verses 14. Okay. 
my click is frozen now. So um, we'll try and set it up again. The important thing to remember, friends, is if you and I stick to the Word of God, we will be saved from the deception that is coming. It's most certainly coming. And you know what? When we look in the world today, the enemy is not happy. He's not happy that we are studying God's Word and coming to a seminar like this. And sometimes, you know, you have problems and you wonder what's going on. It's the devil. He's not happy. He'll, he'll try and make any excuse for you not to come to a meeting. Your, your car might give problems. You might have to have an extraordinary uh, time at work and, and so on and so forth. But notice what it says here. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. See, the thing is, friends, false prophets don't come with a badge and a name tag. The devil doesn't work like that. That's why Jesus said, take heed, beware, no man deceives you. They come in a guise. You know, the other day I wasn't happy at all because someone paid me some money and um, I discovered there was a fake 100 rand bill. I, and, and I couldn't bank it. You know, I mean, I, I could have probably gone to the bank and just packed it, you know, in one of the notes and, and got away with it. But, but my Christian conscience wouldn't let me do that. So I, I took it and I put it into a packet somewhere. I meant to have brought it to you so you could see it, but I'm sure you've probably seen these things around. But anyhow, uh, counterfeiters are quite good. You know what? They can make notes that can pass. But have you ever seen a 13 rand bill? Or a 130 rand bill? I mean, that would be just ludicrous for someone to do that. You pick it up straight away. But friends, you know what? The counterfeit that the devil is using today is disguised and he masquerades as though he was Christ himself. In fact, that's going to be the overwhelming deception. And so no counterfeiter in the world is going to use something that doesn't exist. And so, friends, the devil comes very subtly and very stealthily. And if you and I are not spending time in the Word of God, we will be deceived. And that's why we have brought the revelation of hope to you this evening. So that you can pick up your Bible, and we've got some for you if, if you haven't brought your Bibles, um, and check the Word for yourself. Because Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So if you want to know what's happening in the world, don't read these modern books and magazines. Someone wants a Bible, praise the Lord. Anybody else on the Bible, our friendly ushers will hand it to you. If you can follow me quickly, that's great. But uh, magazines and movies and novels are full of these so-called spectacular ways in which men who masquerade as Christ deceive people. And so people are turning to psychic seers. They are turning to the occult. They are turning to artists instead of turning to the Word of God. This book called The Angels of Deceit is a book that outlines the many religious deceptions that people are falling in today. These counterfeits are leading men and women away from God's Word. Let me give you a few notable examples that came out in very popular secular magazines like the Time magazine in March of 1997. 39 members of Heaven's Gate cult committed mass suicide with their leader, Marshall Applewhite. Why did they do such a thing? They were told that, you know what, if you just die with us, we're going to live again. You know, the devil's lie is when you die, you don't really die, but you live. They said, if you take your life, you will be able to get into this comet called Hale Bob Comet, and you'll be able to follow the comet, uh, and you'll have a better existence somewhere out of this world. And so many people died, friends, 39 cult members. And so when the FBI agents arrived there, because people were phoning now, you know, families missing, families missing. And, and so 
The announcements were made on the radio and the television. If you don't know anywhere where your family is, place a call. Place a call to this number. What was said is they received over 1,500 calls from family members who were anxious and said, I don't know where my family is gone. I don't know. Perhaps they are one of the 39 that died there. So the phone lines were flooded with people. Here's another example that you may remember. In the 1970s, who's that? Jim Jones captured the world's attention. I was a young man then, but I remember the story very vividly. He led 913 members of his group, the People's Temple, into a deception. He claimed he was God. He claimed that he could take them to a better place. And so the people who bought into his life, friends, were deceived by this man. And just days before, he had been given awards by government figures in San Francisco. And so this man took the lives of so many innocent people by poisoning them with some poison. And so we find David Koresh not too long ago. This was also, of course, something that captured the world's attention. Strange teachings in a book. He's, he, he taught in the book of Revelation. But you can tell his teaching on the book of Revelation was not in Christ because many, many people lost their lives in his cult. Many people followed him. They were sincere, but they were sincerely lost because they did not spend time in the Word. Many people remembered when the announcement was made by the FBI's words over national television. Oh my God, they're killing themselves. When they recognized the game was over, that they were soon to be set free, the cult leader said, it's time to take your lives. So according to the website, the site www.cultkitty.org, an estimated 5 to 7 million Americans have been involved in cults or cult-like groups. That's a staggering figure. And when you think of the rest of the world, the numbers get worse. The total number of these groups ranges from 3,000 to 5,000. There are approximately 180,000 new cult recruits every year. And so Jesus said false Christ and false prophets would come. They would claim to have revivals. They would claim to heal the sick. They would claim to open the eyes of the blind. They would claim to make one that was poor, rich. All these great wonders that Jesus spoke of, the book of Revelation repeats them. They would have these great signs and wonders to deceive. And so Jesus warns us about in the book of Revelation 13, verse 13 to 14. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the sight on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Don't miss in the third week when we speak about the mark of the beast. And before we speak about the mark of the beast, we're going to discover who the beast is because the mark of the beast is the mark of the beast. So in order to know what the mark is, you need to identify from Scripture who the beast is and it will be very clear what his mark or sign is. And so Jesus takes us to the signs in the world of politics. Jesus said there would be wars. Someone's saying, but Brian, haven't there been lots of wars? Yes, they have. But Jesus said, friends, it would be an escalation of wars. Not just wars, but rumors of wars. All over the world, it would become global, not just in isolated areas. And today, we see that, friends. We see that all over. We see wars right close by us here, right here in Africa, in the Sudan, all over. Wars in Zimbabwe not so long ago. There was war in Angola not so long ago. War is all over, friends. The scripture warns about war and rumors of war. This is what Jesus had to say. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. And so Jesus predicted that just before the end of the world, there would be international conflicts on a global scale. This is what he said, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And so that prophecy, I'm sure during World War I, the Great War, some 25 million people lost their lives and people all over the world must be saying, this is the end of the world. This is the end of the world. And soon after they had made peace, it wasn't even 25 years later and there was World War II that took 50 million lives 
and so much more untold suffering and misery to the families left behind. And so Jesus said there would be an escalation of wars all over. In fact, in the 20th century, 180 million deaths from war alone. Think about the Vietnam War. Think about the Korean War. Think about the Indo-China conflict. Think about the Iran-Iraq War, the Middle East conflicts, tribal wars in Africa. Friends, think about the global terrorists that are taking cities and wreaking terror all over the world. Everybody probably remembers the day when the Twin Towers came down. And so terrorists now can take a little bomb in a suitcase and go and plant it in a building in a city somewhere and blow up buildings and kill thousands and thousands of people. And so Jesus predicted there would be fragile peace agreements. Men would strike a peace treaty and no sooner has the ink not even dried, they back at war. And so we will never have peace, friends, until the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, comes. And until he rules and reigns in your heart, you and I will never be at peace. Jesus said, peace I give unto you, not as the world give I unto you. My peace I give to you. Where? In your heart, in your mind. You can be at peace with God tonight if you will accept this Christ. In fact, the Apostle Paul describes it this way here. For when they say peace and safety, then, what everyone? Sudden destruction comes upon them and they shall not escape. And so the world has seen many of these so-called peace treaties and many of them have ended up in war. Let me give you some examples. How many times have you heard Israel signing a peace treaty with Hamas and just a few weeks or a few months later, buses are blown up and innocent lives are taken and rockets are fired and then Israel retaliates and more innocent lives are killed. That's the work of the devil, friends. And we will never know peace until we meet the Prince of Peace and we can only find him in the Word of God. And so the Bible says, when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes. You find after the World War I, they had the League of Nations. It didn't last too long because any of the peace treaties did not last. And then after World War II, the United Nations, has it done well? Many of the broken peace deals by the United Nations have just ended up in turmoil and escalation once again. So for all the best efforts of the United Nations, friends, they have failed. But the Bible is so accurate. It speaks of our day. And the Bible said, the Bible says that when Jesus would come, the time would be when the human race is able to actually destroy the world and all those who live in the world. Listen to this here. Revelation 11 verse 18. The nations were angry and your wrath has come in the time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name shall, what? Small and great and should destroy those who destroy the earth. You know, with the nuclear bomb, the world, armaments have capacity to destroy the world over and over again. A couple of stats here. So this, this is the nuclear club. United States, Russia, United Kingdom, France, and China. And of course, don't forget, don't forget that northern, the country of, I've forgotten the country, doesn't matter, is trying to get their own nuclear bomb. North Korea, Pakistan, India, Israel, Iran. These are all trying to get nuclear armaments and the countries that have them already have a capacity to destroy the world over and over again. And so you think about the breakup of the Soviet Union, the, the Soviet Union when all these scientists uh, now found themselves out jobs. And any country that could pay the highest price could get the secrets how to make nuclear bombs. And so we find that, friends, this is what's taking place today. There's enough plutonium, which is the essential ingredient to make a nuclear bomb, for one nuclear bomb every three days. And so we find this is a problem, friends. It's a big problem in the world. And so North Korea and Iran right now are trying to develop their own nuclear weapons. And so a number of years ago, an American newspaper columnist by the name of Walter Lippmann made this statement. This is what he said. 
poised on the brink of the most calamitous conflict that can be imagined. Indeed, it cannot even be imagined. And that's why the Bible says that when you see these things take place, know that Jesus is soon to come. There is going to be a time when God will end the affairs of the nation of this world. It will not end in a nuclear annihilation and the world is destroyed. And so, friends, the signs of times are being fulfilled right now in your eyes and my eyes. In fact, William Ripley, the journalist, said, I am standing on the place where the end of the world began. He was standing where one of the nuclear bombs went off in Japan in Hiroshima. And he warned that this would end up in catastrophe. And so Jesus said he will step across the threshold and he would come to save his people. Because when this earth is in this kind of state, people don't know what is next. Notice what Luke 21 says. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven will be shaken. Friends, the earth is being shaken. Revelation reveals there's hope. There's signs in the world, in the religious world, in the signs, friends, in the political world. There's signs in the natural world. There's signs, friend, in the world of nature that Jesus is soon to come. Friends, Christ said many of these things would take place. He spoke of many of the things that we are witnessing today. Think of things like, friends, tornadoes. Think about fire. The, math, the book of the Bible, Matthew, in the book of Matthew 24, Jesus said these things would take place. I'm getting so excited, I'm getting a little bit tongue-tied. And so Jesus said there would be fire, there would be floods, there would be hurricanes, there would be tornadoes. And friends, you remember in 2011 what took place, that terrible earthquake that shook Japan. I visited Japan a few months after that. <laughs> terrible, terrible time. And Jesus said these things would take place. What about famine? Christ predicted there would be famines. And you might say to me, Brian, well, famines have been around. Well, Jesus said there would be famines, plural. And so, friends, we realize that the Bible is true. This is what Jesus had to say in Matthew 24, verse 7. There will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. And we can still remember the images on TV of those who were in Ethiopia? What about in the Sudan right now? And because wherever there's war, famine follows. People can't go and plow and plant. And so famine is taking place all over the world on an epidemic scale, friends. We find that the United Nations report says the food, there's only food storage in 38 countries. As we look over the world, friends, this prophecy and others are being fulfilled. In fact, it says that one-sixth of the population of the world one-sixth of the seven billion go to bed hungry every night while you and I here in the city of Durban have more than enough to spare. Estimates, friends, are getting worse and worse. In fact, the United Nations say 3.5 million people a year die of starvation. 10,000 people a day. And so scientists are worried, Mikhail, that there's not enough land to plant. I don't know if that's the question. I don't know if that's the question. They worried about the fact that there's not enough countries planting enough food to feed the world. You know what? If one country like the United States would take its spending money on armaments and invest it in agriculture, they probably can feed the whole world several times over. So they are saying land is depleting. Less and land is being planted. And so as a result, the, the Bible also says pestilence would follow. What is a pestilence? Jesus said this year in Matthew 24, verse 7, there would be famines, pestilences, 
and earthquakes in various places. And so a pestilence is what? A strange disease which afflicts human beings, crops, and the environment. Sometimes the way how human beings take care of the environment, how they spray their crops, and how they put all these hormones into animals so they, they can grow quickly. And then you find that those hormones become so out of tune with what is man's diet that it causes problems. Another form of pestilence are new diseases that are springing up around the world. You think what's happening right now in Africa with the Ebola virus. Around us today, we see all these things, mad cow disease, bird flu, HIV, the Marburg virus and Lyme disease. 2.4 billion pounds of toxic pollutants cause an estimated 50,000 to 120,000 premature deaths every year. And so there's a warning to humanity here. No more than one or a few decades remain before the chance to avert the new threats we now confront will be lost and the prospects of humanity immeasurably diminished. And so earthquakes, Jesus said there would be many earthquakes and in different places. There have been earthquakes before, friends, but they've been here and there, just a few. But Jesus says, friends, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places all over the world. All over the world, you would see these terrible things taking place. In fact, the biggest earthquake will take place just before Jesus comes. This is one of the plagues that will end the time on this earth. Notice what it says here in Revelation 6 verse 14. Then the sky receded as a scroll when he's rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of his place. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake. The greatest earthquake, friends will announce the coming of Christ. In fact, when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, there was a great earthquake. In Matthew 27, verse 51, it says, The graves were shaken, and many of those who slept in the graves rose up after His resurrection. In fact, when Jesus came forth from the tomb, another earthquake announced, He's alive. When He comes the second time, an earthquake will take place, friends. Such a mighty and great earthquake as has not occurred since men we on the earth. The good news is those who have the seal of God will not be affected by any of the seven plagues, friends. God will protect His people from the plagues. Only those who have the mark of the beast will be affected by the seven plagues. And so earthquakes will increase, friends, all over. In fact, seismologists tell us, friends, that 35 earthquakes a day. This is a bit of an old static, uh, old... Uh, uh, a statistician, notice I looked today, just the other day, what's taking place right now. 81 earthquakes occurred in the past seven days. We had one just the other day right here in South Africa, right? And notice what they said, hundreds of people die in earthquake, no one bats an eye. Magnitude 4 tremor in South Africa and everyone loses their minds. So, Wherever it happens all over the world, they're so used to it. So when thousands die, it's just like another day. South Africa, you have a, a four on the wrist scale, and everyone's wondering what's going on. And one person lands up in hospital. Luke 21 verse one, 11 says this, And there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines, and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs, friend, from heaven. So there will be an upheaval in nature. I'm going to go quickly, friends. Luke 21 verse 26 says, Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. And so we see, just as Jesus said, there would be floods, there would be famine, there would be pestilences, there would be wars, there would be fires, great loss of life would take place, friends. But know that these are just the birth pangs. They are announcing the soon coming of Jesus Christ. And when you see these things take place, friends, don't lose heart. Look up. Christ is soon to come. He's on the way. In fact, friends, very, very soon, Jesus will be here. And so we are told that there are major earthquakes all over the world, major tsunamis all over the world. And so we find some of them took place very not so long ago. The Asian tsunami in December 26, 2004, a 9.1 magnitude 
on the Richter scale, over 230,000 were killed. Indescribable damage, friends. The 2005 Atlantic hurricane season, mostly named, uh, the storms were mostly named, friends, during this time year. And it says Hurricane Katrina was the costliest storm in history, over 75 billion in damage and the economic impact of 250 billion. And so we see this on the news headlines, we see it on television, we read in our papers, and it's kind of like we become desensitized to it. We're so used to seeing all these things that we just, it's just another day, yet thousands and thousands of lives are lost, many families separated, and many can't live on. And so Christ spoke about the moral decay. In fact, this is what it says here in Matthew 24, verse 23. 37 and 38, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as it was in the days before the flood, they were doing what? Eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And so, friends, we see that in the world today. People are worried about parting. People are worried about eating and drinking and having fun. And all the time, Christ is about to end the judgment in heaven. And it will soon come in the clouds of glory. So as it happened in the days of Noah, so will it be, friends. There would be a breakup of the family unit, complacent attitude towards spiritual things and moral living. And so 50 to 75% of all marriages today end up in divorce. And who suffers, friends? The poor children suffer. The parents suffer. But the children suffer the most. It's a sad world we live in. But friends, Christ says to you and I, look up. When you see these things happening, I'm soon to come. Although there's rising crime and violence, Jesus says, I'm coming soon. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. This is the time of Noah. That every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. And so it says, the earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Is what we see in the world today? It's exactly what we see in the news headlines. We see it here in South Africa. All the violence, all the carjacking, all the murder, all the rape, friends. All over the world, we find here the World Report on Violence and Health from the World Health Organization. This is 2002. It's a whole lot worse now. Each year, more than 1.6 million people worldwide lose their lives to violence. Many more are injured and suffer from a range of physical, sexual, reproductive, and mental health problems. And so we find, friends, this is all because of what people are allowing in their minds. So much violence they watch on TV, and so it comes out in their thoughts and their thoughts leads to actions. And this is what's happening right now before our eyes. We find the economic uncertainty in the world, friends. You, you, you see it. You see it all over. And you just know it's coming. It's coming. Notice what James says. Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted. And your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded. And your corrosion. And their corrosion will be a witness against you. And will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in what days? In the last days. He says, indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. He says, you have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. And the revelation, the book of Revelation warns all those with this text here. Revelation 18, 74, in one hour such great riches came to nothing. You know, when calamity strikes, your riches mean absolutely nothing. When you are hit with a terminal disease like cancer, your riches mean nothing. Friends, only a life in Christ is worth investing in. And so Jesus said these signs would take place. We're just about to wrap things up. Christ said the signs would be fulfilled. I'm going to give you a summary, a quick overview. He said, first thing in Matthew 24, false Christs and false prophets would come. They would arise and they would try to deceive many. Wars and rumors of wars. Cries of peace but no peace. Famines, pestilences. He said earthquakes, sexual immorality, homes falling apart, violence filling the lands, economic uncertainty. But there's one more sign that we find, friends, that Daniel mentions too. 
a sign that is so prevalent in our days. Knowledge would be increased. Daniel 12 verse 4 says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Notice the book of Daniel was sealed until how long? The time of the end. We are living in the time of the end. We're going to look at that prophecy in another night. When did that time begin? Not so long ago, friends. And so this is what God said to Daniel. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. And today, friends, there is such a vast amount of knowledge. The technical gadgets we have and the cars and the rockets and the spacecraft and all that's taking place in the economic world, friends, in the political world, all over the world, we see this happening. But you know what? When Daniel was told about that, true it is, knowledge has been increased these days. If anyone doesn't think that, just think about the computer age. Knowledge has increased. But you know what, friends? Daniel was speaking more about that than the knowledge that we have from our great scientists scientific minds. 90% of all scientists and technicians that have ever lived are living today with a boom of knowledge, an explosion of knowledge. And so Daniel says, and knowledge shall increase. But I want to say to you tonight, the knowledge that is most important is not the wisdom of men. It's not the knowledge that you find in the university, in a degree. It's not the knowledge, friends, of what you know about what's happening in your business, it's a knowledge about the Word of the Lord. And you find that in the Bible, and it's at meetings like this where we can understand the Word of the Lord. Because Jesus said, after He mentioned all these signs, in Matthew 24, verses 14, He gave the overall last sign. He says, and the gospel of this kingdom shall be preached to all nations for a witness, and then the end would come. And so we are living in that time when the gospel is going all over the world because the proclamation, the book of Revelation, the heart of the book, we have the three angels' messages. These messages go to the entire world quickly. Let me just take you there. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of where? Heaven, having the everlasting gospel. What is to be done with this everlasting gospel? It is to be preached to who? Those who dwell on the earth. To what people? To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And so, friends, we're going to look at this wonderful prophecy in the next two nights, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so God is on the move. God is on the move all over the world. People are coming to know this Christ. People are making decisions to have a committed relationship with this Jesus Christ. And they are sealing it by baptism. We're going to look at that another night. We're going to study the rite of baptism all over the world, in the Soviet Union, in Russia, all over the world, in the Philippines, in South America, all over the world, in Africa, in China, in India. The gospel is going everywhere, friends. And we are seeing it going, we are seeing it go at lightning speed through satellite television, through the internet, through DVDs. Take DVDs from your friends. Give them to your friends. It is going through the world all over. Bibles are available. People can understand the Bible. And many are accepting this Christ. They are coming by the hundreds and by the thousands to receive this Jesus who is on His way. Friends, let me tell you, the time is short. Jesus is soon to come. And we don't have much time on this earth anymore. God is on the move. Soon, friends, very soon, the last, last hour in the judgment will take place and Jesus will declare these words, it is done. The book of Revelation 22, it is done. He says, behold, I am coming quickly. And so friends, the whole idea of these meetings is for you and I to prepare for the soon coming of Christ. How many tonight will say, I see where we stand in the scope of this earth's history. And I want to be ready when Jesus comes. I don't want to be lost. As for me, friends, I, I, I don't stand up here to waste your time. I don't do this to be paid. No, God has called me to preach the everlasting gospel because it's a burning desire in my heart that I might be ready and that God would use me in any way 
to lead others to a knowledge of this Jesus, this Christ, who is soon to come. Is that your desire tonight? As I pray, would you like to lift your hand as I just pray and ask God's blessing upon you? Let us pray. Father, this evening, we recognize and realize we are living in the last days. Christ is soon to come. We don't know the day or the hour, but you have given us these signs to know it's soon to take place. And Father, the day that we die, our probation ends and no one knows when they will die. And so, if I were to walk out of this room tonight and sleep the sleep of death because of a heart attack or a murder or a car accident, I want to get up on the first resurrection to see Jesus in the clouds and spend eternity with Him. If any of us in this room are privileged to live, to see you coming in the clouds, Lord, we want to be amongst the 144,000 that are sealed in their foreheads with the name of their Father. The seal that you have given is the seal of the Holy Spirit bringing your word into our hearts and minds so that we might be saved. I pray for all hands that have been raised here this evening. Bless each one here, Lord, that as we live here, we will consider, is my life right with you? Is there something I'm holding back on? I pray that each one may give their hearts, their lives to you, so that when you come in the clouds of glory, we might be ready to see Jesus. We ask in his name. Amen. Chris is going to sing a beautiful hymn for us. I'm sorry we've been a little bit behind with our technical problems, but listen to this beautiful hymn as Chris sings. The song's called Refiner's Fire. One 
set apart for you, my master, ready to do your, ready to do your, ready to do What beautiful words to close this evening, ready to do your will. So friends, we have the privilege of saying uh, we've come to the end, and may God be with you as you travel home safely. Tomorrow evening is a really interesting topic. Those of you who have a program on hand, Thursday evening, sorry, they keep reminding me. Yes, I know you won't be here tomorrow evening. <laughs> Thursday evening. Um, interesting topic. It is titled very simply, Revelations Star Wars. Now, I don't know if there are any Darth Vader fans in the room. Um, it's not that kind of Star Wars. But um, if you feel the need to come in your Darth Vader outfit, we will still let you in the door. Um, but please do come and join us on, on Thursday evening. And we will also have the privilege of introducing to you Dr. Adele Becker, is a pediatrician with her own practice, and she's going to be unpacking for us um, both the sad and the happy side of depression. And what we, it's a very sad truth, but what can we do about it? So something very simple, very practical. So we invite you to join us on Thursday evening and not tomorrow for Revelation Star Wars and for what we can do with depression. So, Nolan? Folks, there's uh, refreshments provided for you just outside. Please feel free to stay. We also have our literature stand. And tonight's uh, book on offer, uh, free of charge, is The Great Hope. So please take, what, uh, take a copy and take, a, take one for a friend as well. There are also, of course, uh, Brian's DVD from last night, which is available, as well as Kim Roro's, uh, uh, the very same topic available as well, so please feel free uh, to take one of those. Also, we have your Bible study guide, which the ushers will give to you uh, as you uh, leave. So please uh, have a read and fill in uh, the quiz at the back, because on Thursday when you return, we will go through that together. Thank you for coming, and God bless. <laughs>